And music is such an important component of spirituality for me, and we are so blessed. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, for <laughs> aligning us in the now moment with that deep love and sweet life. Yeah. <laughs> so, good morning again. <laughs> if any of you were here last Sunday, you may have noticed this talk title with my name on it on the um, insert in the program. Uh, because I was supposed to give the living now, or now living, pardon me, uh, talk last week. But then you know how things change, and suddenly it made more sense in that now moment as it was approaching for Dr. Mark to give the talks that Sunday, which meant that I would give the now or now living talk <laughs> then, which was the next Sunday, which just happens to be now. <laughs> Did you all follow that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just piece of cake from there. <laughs> so, you know, one of the basic tenets of metaphysics is that each and every moment of life has a beauty, a richness to it. And if we're open to experiencing that beauty, every, every part of life is beautiful and wonderful. And so, Harry and Fran, who had been married 65 years and were now in their 90s, discovered that this phase of life involved a lot of really being in the now, to the point that in the now moment, if they thought about something that should be done or purchased then, they should write it down. Because when that moment came up, they wouldn't remember. And so Fran really took to this list-making thing. She, she got it down pat. Anything she thought about went on the list. Harry was a little bit more stubborn. Harry's philosophy was if there are fewer than three items, he was not going to write them down because he could remember. So one night after dinner, Harry mentioned to Fran, wouldn't it be nice to have a nice bowl of Rocky Road ice cream? And Fran said, oh, that would be awesome, but um, we don't have any. Harry said, that's OK. You know, he was in the mood to take a little walk down to the corner market. He said, I'll go get some. So as he's getting ready to leave, Fran says, Harry, don't forget to write it down. And he goes, oh, for God's sake, Fran, it's only one thing. I think I can remember ice cream. So off Harry goes to the store. He comes back with his bag of groceries, sets it on the counter, Fran goes up, looks in, and lo and behold, she finds two large cans of their favorite soup. <laughs> At which point, Fran just says, oh my goodness, Harry, I told you to write it down, you old fool. Seriously, two cans of soup? You completely forgot the crackers. <laughs> <laughs> Personally, I'm a little concerned just having just crossed the threshold into my 60s how well I could relate to that story. <laughs> so now living, being in the now, have you ever had that really awkward situation where someone is speaking to you, maybe they're bearing their soul, and you are right there with them listening when all of a sudden their voice kind of fades into the background <laughs> as your attention goes to that comment that, that your boss made to you that morning. What was that about? That was really nasty. Or maybe it's about, what am I going to have for dinner tonight? Did I remember to buy the ice cream? Um, <laughs> and you're off in this other world when all of a sudden you hear these dreaded words that bring you back to the now moment, like, I would really, really appreciate your input on this. <laughs> oh dear, busted, huh? Well, you know, here in Science of Mind, we're all about giving you spiritual tools to deal with these things. So I'm gonna tell you, the best way to deal with this is adopt a pensive look. Like you're, <laughs> you're thinking about what they said. 
That gives you the chance to go back and say, can I re recall anything they were saying to me while I was distracted? No, I can't. OK, now can I think of a response I could give that wouldn't reveal that I wasn't listening? How about, wow, that's a tough one. You know, I just don't know that I have anything to offer. What do you think? <laughs> Those are kind of uncomfortable moments, aren't they? <laughs> Please tell me it isn't just me. <laughs> but you know, we teach that left to their own devices, our minds can just wander off in all kinds of directions. And the reason that's significant is in Science of Mind, we, Science of Mind, we keep promoting this idea that our thoughts are creative, that our life experiences are very consistent with what we're thinking, perceiving, and believing. And the more our thoughts are aligned with an awareness of a presence of goodness in us, a presence of good, God's goodness in everything that can be revealed, even if the re moment right now doesn't reflect it, the more good we experience in our lives, the more we're open to calling forth goodness into every situation. Since God is present everywhere, fully and equally, in each and every one of us, around us, then what we teach is that every moment represents a moment in which we can experience and express the goodness that God is. But part of our God nature just happens to be free will. And so we have the freedom to think of ourselves as being separate from God, to have all kinds of perceptions of lack and limitation that can create all kinds of havoc in our lives, in our minds. And so that's why, amongst the many different practices that we promote in this teaching, one that we really try to get people to engage in is a regular practice of meditation. Because through meditation, we become more mindful of where our attention is going in any given moment. We tend to promote here the Buddhist style of Vipassana meditation, where you find something to focus on in the now. It could be your breath. It could be an activity that you're doing. If you're walking, it's just like focusing on every step, just being in the now moment. When we do that, we cultivate the muscle to notice when our attention goes off, to be aware and say, oh, my mind has wandered, to observe where it went, maybe observe that for a while, and then bring the awareness back to the breath. That's how we develop the muscle to be able to notice where our mind has gone and bring it back to where we might want it to be. Now, when we hear about this now living, the words of Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh, live the actual moment. Only this moment is life. Does that mean that we're never allowed to think about the past or look ahead to the future? Does living in the now mean that I can never think back about a really wonderful time in my life and share that with others? Do I never get to look ahead at what I might want to buy or have for dinner tonight? I mean, if we are just living in this now moment and only focusing on what's going on right now, so. I'm focusing on the bristles of the toothbrush on my teeth, and that's all life is allowed to be. And I'm never, ever again allowed to have a fantasy or think about a goal or anything like that. I mean, what's the point, right? <laughs> Don't we also emphasize in this teaching the value of looking ahead and setting goals, ways that we can experience our God nature more fully in the future? I mean, don't we teach that reflecting on the past, that uh, we can remember how God's presence was there and how it's still present today, or we can learn from a past mistake and maybe see something that was hurtful in a new light to heal that pain? So if we're only in the now moment, how, how do we plan for our future? How do we make use of that wonderful past and all the lessons that it gave us? And that's where I want us to understand today that the truth of the matter is we cannot not live in the now. It's impossible. You know, Eckhart Tolle, I hope I pronounced it correctly, <laughs> 
Um, I got some coaching from Maya Hyams. <laughs> Eckhart Tolle tells us that life is now. There was never a time when your life was not now, nor will there ever be. And what that means is, see, if I'm thinking about the past, I'm having a now moment of the past. If I'm thinking about the future, I am having a now moment of what is yet to come. And so, depending on what I'm thinking, what my awareness and what my perception is of the past or the future dictates my experience right here and right now. So the key in all of this is awareness, right? It's just for us to be aware where our attention is going. And if we notice that our thoughts of the past or the future are not necessarily supporting us in having a greater experience of good, that's when we can then absolutely make a decision to change the way we think. You know, we keep emphasizing in this teaching that the only place that we have control, really control, is over our thoughts. So if we notice that our thoughts are not supporting us in having a good experience of life, and we notice that, we can then make a choice. We can exercise the power to choose to think differently, to see things in a different way. So that brings me back to this idea of meditation. I know that this is probably the spiritual practice that, at least in this Western culture, we resist the most. Why? Because we are the doers of the world. We like to get things done and accomplish. And a meditation is really just about sitting and being still and being in the now and watching. And that can feel very unproductive. But another thing that came to me that I realized about the resistance we have is I think a lot of people assume that every time you meditate, you're going to feel peaceful and wonderful. But if you've got a lot of turmoil going on in your subjective mind, if there's a lot that you're worrying about or concerned, and you get still, what's going to happen? You're going to start feeling those uncomfortable feelings, right? Now, in our society, we don't deal with uncomfortable very well. We really don't. And I love the analogy I heard one time, that the way we deal with uncomfortable is kind of like if you were driving your car and the oil light were to come on, we know what to do, right? We know that we're supposed to pull over to the side of the road, pop the hood, find the wire that's connected to the light, pull it, the light goes out, and then we drive <laughs> off. <laughs> Isn't that how we like to deal with pain and discomfort? Just push it away, push it away. But here's the problem with that 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 discomfort that you're experiencing emotionally is due to some kind of perception that you are suppressing. And if you're not willing to just notice what's going on and suppress it, those limiting, lack, fear-based thoughts that you're carrying are going to drive your tendency to engage once again in that how hurt I was by that experience of the past, or oh my god, all the woes that are going to come to you in the future. Because you're, you're basically not dealing with this fear and sense of lack going on in you. If, however, if you can adopt a practice where you can sit and suddenly notice, notice that there's some discomfort. And as Buddhist nun Pema Chodron ex, um, encourages us, that's the word I was looking for, encourages us to do is to adopt this attitude of fascination, like, wow, that's, that's a real sense of insecurity. That's a real feeling of, I'm not enough, or there isn't enough. As we notice that and sit with that for a moment, then we can bring our awareness back to the now, just take a deep breath, come back into the now moment, realize that 99% of the time, all of our needs in this now moment are met turn our awareness back to how much love we still have in us, all the people we love, things we love, that nature of God that is untouched by whatever's going on. And now that we're aware of what the thoughts are, the fear-based thoughts, we know how to deal with that, right? 
That's when we start to direct our prayers, our affirmations, working with our practitioners. That's when we start to do the work to realize that that is just a false belief and replace it with a knowingness that God is ever present in every moment there to reveal whatever solutions there to absolutely help us to know that we are not defined by our past. So, my recent experience with putting this concept into practice I have to tell you first about a little ritual that my partner Joe and I have. Uh, Joe gets up really early in the morning, and so he tends to nod off earlier. And uh, we have this little ritual where I will get on one end of the couch, and he likes to stretch out on the couch. I'll watch TV, and he will fall asleep, and then later go in to the bedroom. But we also have our two birds, our parrots, our mini macaws, Chloe and Puffin, with us. And Puffin likes to sit right here and cuddle up to my neck. And Chloe likes to climb down and go climb onto Joe and sit there. And about a year and a half ago, Chloe invented this game that she taught me, where she starts bobbing her head. And eventually, when I notice that and I bob my head back, she looks up when I do that. She says, kiss. And so when I look back and say, kiss, she goes, mwah. <laughs> and I go, mwah. <laughs> and we do that back and forth for a while. And then we get both, I go back to watching TV. She goes back to doing whatever. <laughs> so <laughs> sometimes uh, Joe notices little holes in his shirt the next day. But that's another story. <laughs> so put that to the side for a moment. Another thing some of you may know is last September, I have a 94-year-old friend for whom I'm the trustee. She has no family, and she started experiencing uh, difficulties where she needed to get into assisted living. And it was quite a journey, but we found the perfect place. And we were so relieved to get her moved into this wonderful place, only to find that right then, all the management people like left. Within two weeks, None of the directors or managers were still there. About 15 other staff members were gone, and things were falling apart. My friend was not getting the service that she was promised. I became her advocate about everything from medication management to, would you please just step up and do what you said you were going to do? Finally, finally, I felt I'd been heard when I had a meeting with the new executive director and someone else, and I made it clear what needed to happen, and they heard me, and they agreed. And I left feeling much more comfortable until a couple of weeks later, I received the bill. Oh, did they fail to mention that now that they understood her needs, they felt they could raise the rates by 2,000 a month? If ever you wanted to witness a now moment of Reverend Mark LaPonce being in I am not amused mode, that was it. <laughs> That evening, on the couch, Puffin, Chloe, Joe, TV, do you think I'm even remotely there? Oh, no, 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 no. My mind is off just yelling at these people, telling them how wrong they are, going off and off and off and off. And finally, at some point, you know, my blood pressure now is up probably 30 points. My stomach is in knots, having a wonderful now moment of the future. And... <laughs> I think it was around the point that in my fantasy, I was organizing a move out of every single resident in the facility, <laughs> causing the place to go bankrupt. And of course, it's all covered by every national television station. <laughs> Showed you. <laughs> right? All of a sudden, my peripheral vision catches this motion, and I'm pulled back into my living room, and I notice that for some time now, Chloe's been bobbing her head and bobbing her head. So finally, I bob my head back, to which she says, kiss, very emphatically, like, finally. <laughs> I think the poor thing was so worried that all that hard work she'd done to train me was out the window. <laughs> But as I was pulled back into that now moment, I realized, what am I doing? And as I got still, just got still, first of all, I went to my mantra of God is the love that I am. That works so well for me. And I could just feel the love in me, feel the love for these beautiful creatures. 
realize how I had just been robbing myself of the sweetness, sweetness of life in that moment. Feeling that, seeing how God was there, I got still and started to realize that the underlying fear was all about, I have to fix this. There's no solution. You know, it's going to be too hard, too much, and all of that. That gave me the awareness of, oh, maybe I need to remember that I am just a channel of God and that in this vast universe that God is, that there is a solution. I might be part of it. I don't need to do it all myself. But that's when I was able to start redirecting my thoughts and beliefs to something constructive. And someone from the last talk asked me, so how did it end up? It's a work in progress. But let me tell you, one way that the universe supported me as I was open to it, suddenly I found out there's a whole group of advocates that are coming together to meet with people, to talk about this. So we're moving forward. It's not all about Mark LaPonce fixing the whole world, right? So what I invite you to do is, first of all, if you don't already have a practice where you're sitting still periodically, noticing what's going on, just spend a few moments every day and be willing, if there are uncomfortable feelings coming up, be willing to just notice them, observe them for a moment, then bring your attention back to the now moment. Take a deep breath. Let's do that right now. See how something just realigns when we do that? That's that presence of God's love and intelligence. It's always there. Bring your awareness to the now moment. Bring your awareness to how much love there is in your life that's untouched by the situation. Bring your awareness to that presence of the sacred that is always there no matter what. And then you begin to do your spiritual work to really, really embody that new perception that God is there. God has always been there. God will always be there. As we can retrain ourselves to absolutely know that, our now moments of reminiscing about the past, of observing the present, and of contemplating the future possibilities that, that we could step into will always reflect some version of God is here, always has been, always will be. And so now I say that we should pray. <laughs> So as I turn my attention inward, right here, right now, I know we join together in the knowingness of that one power, that one presence, that one infinite invisible that, that I call God that is present here, right now, has ever been, always shall be, that there is God and only God, and that goodness fills and surrounds us in every moment of our lives. And so I know that as we come together today to know this truth, we come to a greater realization of this absolute love, wholeness, and goodness that can never abandon us, and how it has always been there, how we can appreciate it, feel it, and sense it in the now, and we open to all the magnificent possibilities of how it reveals itself in the then. I know that where there is any need to obsess and feel connected to any past mistake or hurt or worry about what life is yet to come. That dissolves as we feel that ever-present love, goodness, that God is always. And so we let this prayer be a prayer for our loved ones, for situations in the world that call to our attention, anywhere that we feel Others are wanting to know that ever presence of God. We know God is there, and through that knowingness, God is revealed. We bless our church. We bless all churches everywhere, synagogues, temples, mosques, ashrams, all paths to God. And with a full and grateful heart for that goodness that God always is, I release this word, knowing it is so. I let it be, and so it is. And together we say, 